Good morning, Harmony Church. I want to welcome you to another Church in Place uh, Sunday morning worship service. Glad that you've joined us. I uh, hope that you're enjoying this wonderful spring weather, uh, middle of April, and it's warming up, and uh, the flowers are blooming, and it's just wonderful, and just great weather to praise the Lord, and so hope that you're doing that, hope you're taking the opportunity to praise God this morning with us. Uh, I do want to mention uh, and, and remind everybody that's watch, watching, uh, if you're watching us online live, make sure that you're liking it and sharing it so other people can follow along. Uh, we do post our services later on on YouTube. And uh, so we're trying to share as much as we can, trying to get as many people connected as possible. So uh, the more that we can share, the more that we can talk about it, the more people we can connect with. So hope that you will do that. We have uh, daily devotions. We certainly have our Sunday morning services. We have a Wednesday Bible study. Uh, so just I hope again that you're sharing with your friends, sharing on your uh, social media just so that more people can come and, and uh, just be blessed by our services and studies. I um, want to remind you to go to our website, which is harmonyfwbchurch.org. Uh, there's links to our social media there and uh, other information that you can find. And uh, so hope again that you will uh, go by there. I uh, also want to remind that if you are interested in giving or if you're interested in uh, giving back to the Lord and tithing as he has asked us to do, you can do that on that same web page or you can mail a check to the church or you can give by text. I know I'm probably going fast for our technical folks that are uh, trying to have things below um, that uh, makes it easier for you to connect with that. So uh, again, go to our website. That's the best place to go and, and to get all that information and have it right in front of you. Also wanted to mention, if anybody has any type of need in this time, you know, we were still the church. Uh, we still want to be available to people if they have any type of need. If we're able to help, we want to be able to do that. And so if you know of somebody that's having trouble shopping, they can't get out to do shopping, or maybe they're having, having trouble finding specific items, uh, give us a call at the church. It's 559 251 Five six three zero. Uh, give us a call. We'd love to help out, and, and we've certainly done that, and we'll continue to do that as long as there's a need for that. Uh, if there's anybody that needs any kind of supplies, or you know, I, I wanted to mention too, if there's anybody that's just struggling and you need to talk to somebody, you need some counseling or whatever, please call the church. We have pastors and we have counselors and we have just people that want to love and help and do everything that they can in this time. So hopefully uh, take advantage of that. Give us a call and we would love to get in contact with you. Uh, right now we're going to go into our worship service, but before we do, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful as we come to you this morning. Lord, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word, Lord. And I just pray that your spirit would guide, Lord, first, guide our hearts in song as we sing back praises to you, Father. And then I pray that your spirit would guide our hearts as we open your word and that we are influenced by your word and your spirit, Father. Lord, we're so grateful for the church family that we have and the opportunity we have to come together even in this way, Father. Lord, we give you the praise. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Harmony Church. We miss you all. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. We hope that you'll join in with us and sing. Uh, lift your voices in praise and worship to the Lord as we sing King of Love. <laughs>
Kate, Jen reviewing Psalm 145, 5-7. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will merit it. They shall speak of you, the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Psalm 145, 5-7.
God, we give you our hearts. This morning, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, Lord, as pastor brings your word and the message that you have for us. God, we ask that you would help it to just penetrate deep into our hearts. Lord, soften us, mold us into what it is that you want us to be. God, we pray that you would give us the strength that we need to stand up for you through whatever we come against in life, Lord. Give us the strength. Give us the courage. Lord, help us to know that you are here for us. And God, that you are you are our strength, that we have nothing besides you. We thank you, God, that you love us. We thank you for your mercy, God, for the grace that you show us. We don't deserve it, and Lord, yet you've given it to us so freely. We pray, God, that you would help us. Help us to show your love through our actions, God, that we would point others towards you. We love you. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. And God, we ask all of these in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Good morning, Harmony Church family. We are so glad you've joined us this morning. And hope that you are having a wonderful day and enjoying uh, God's beautiful day that He has made. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, We say that, uh, and you say, no, that was last week because we celebrated Easter last week. Well, no, that's every Sunday because that's the reason we worship on Sunday, because of Christ's resurrection. And uh, so, happy Resurrection Day. And let's uh, get into God's Word this morning. We're going to begin our uh, study of the book of Philippians, a book of joy, a book of love that Paul uh, writes uh, for us. Now, letter writing today is a lost art in this day of digital communication, of cell phones, computers, mobile devices, texting, email, all these kinds of things. Uh, Letter writing is a lost art. It's just not something we do anymore. In fact, um, if you uh, talk to teenagers and uh, even some young adults today and get them to address a postcard or address a letter, uh, they may not know how to do that uh, because it's just not something they've ever done. You know, and uh, uh, even today, I don't write a whole lot of letters. Uh, But there was a time in my past, not too distant past because I'm not that old, but uh, back uh, in in my college days, uh, we went to uh, the Free Will Baptist Bible College, now known as Welch in Nashville, Tennessee. And one of the things that happened every evening, Monday through Friday, was the mail run between the girls' dorm and the guys' dorm. And this is what would happen. And uh, the guys had until dinner time on uh, that evening to write a letter to their girl, the one that they uh, were trying to woo or their girlfriend or their fiancé, whatever it was. They'd drop it in a box. It would be delivered uh, to the girls. And then at 9.30 that evening, it would be picked up from the girls' dorm and brought back to the guys' dorm. And the guys would be in the... Uh, lobby area just waiting in anticipation for that letter that was going to come. Yeah, this sounds really, (laughs) this sounds really sad to be quite honest, but when you only have three phones in each dorm, one on each floor and and they are in the stairwell, you just don't have a whole lot of time and they're all pay phones, so you don't have a whole lot of uh, opportunity to call and talk on the phone. And this was right when cell phones were just coming into place and it was a big box, a big bag that you carried with you. It wasn't the small things that we have today. And uh, again, this was 1990, 1991, that uh, period of time. So you can count back and figure out how old you think I am. But uh, this, was, this was a wonderful thing. 
uh, to be able to get this letter from this girl, the young lady that you were uh, um, excited for, this love letter, and you open up that big box that uh, night as it came back to the guy's dorm, and the smell of mixed perfumes would just permeate the whole lobby, which was a good thing because this is the guy's dorm, and you know how those can be. But uh, then everybody would be passing out these letters, and you'd go back to your room, and you'd read this letter, and you'd reread it, and you would reread it, and these love letters from your girlfriends, and you would be thinking about what it is you wanted to write uh, for the next day, and uh, what your conversation would be uh, the next day. Now, the reason for this mailbox is because generally after dinner time. Uh, you there was not mixed company. The guys were in their dorms or in the library. The ladies were in their dorm or in the library. So mixed company was uh, not uh, available at that, that day and time uh, at the college. But letter writing was just uh, an exciting thing. This box coming uh, to the door and hopefully getting a response to the letter that you had written. Now Paul is writing a letter of love and joy to the Philippian church family. This letter is full of warmth and genuine concern for the recipients. It bears the markings of a letter between great friends, uh, people who really care about each other. And there are those that have gone through this letter and they, and they uh, mark the various things that uh, should be in a letter between good friends. And this is some of the things they say. The personal greeting in verses, we see this in uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, there's, it's Paul and Timothy are writing to you. It's, there's no mention of status or position that Paul is an apostle or anything like that. It's just a letter between friends. And it's sent to all the saints along with the overseers and the deacons. It's for the whole church family, all those that are there. It's not for just one particular person. But the second mark of a, of a good uh, letter to between friends is a prayer for the recipients or a concern for them. And we see that in chapter, in verse one, in chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Where Paul says, I thank God in all my remembrance you. I hold you in my heart, uh, uh, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And he lays out a prayer for them in that section. But then we have another mark, the reassurance about Paul's current situation. He is a prisoner in Rome at this point in time, and he's writing to them and assuring them about uh, what's going on in his life and how things are working out for God's glory in his life. Then another mark is the concern uh, to know about their situation, to know what's going on in the Philippian church, how God is working, how they are holding up in the midst of difficulties. And then the, another mark is the movements of fellowship friends, uh, fellow friends and ministers, um, ministry partners. The church in Philippi had sent Epaphroditus to Paul, to, to be an encouragement and a help to him, to minister to him. And he had fallen sick, and Paul sending him back to them to encourage them. And, but he also tells them that he wants to send Timothy back to them to uh, help them and to uh, teach them and encourage them. Then there's the exchange of secondhand greetings. You know how we are when we see an old friend or someone we haven't seen in a while and they say, hey, say hello to your parents for me or say hi to so-and-so for me or say, uh, tell, uh, give your wife a hug for me. And that it goes on in uh, chapter 4, verses 21 and 22. And then finally, the closing prayer for good health, for God's blessing. We see that at the very end of chapter 4. But there is also a discussion of deeper things, which, is, uh, which really goes to show the relationship level of Paul with the Philippian church. He's not just doing all these uh, um, frou-frou things, all these lighter things, all these shallow things. He's going deep into uh, uh, heavier topics. He talks about unity. He talks about right thinking. He talks about the power of the gospel and their partnership with him. In that. And these again are all marks of a letter written with genuine love and concern for those reading the letter. 
Let's look at Philippians 1 and read just a short section, verses 3 through 6, to get a feeling for this letter that he is writing. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you, all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Such love, such compassion, such tenderness toward this church family. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this letter that uh, you provide for us in your word of Paul's love, his concern, his care for this people. And Lord, as we read it, as we study it, as we get into it, may you open up our hearts and minds and help us to see, to understand the joy that Paul proclaims throughout this letter, this love that he uh, pours out on them, Lord. May we experience those same things and may we uh, share that same love for those around us. Again, challenge and change us through your word this morning, Lord. Open up our hearts and minds. Help us to see Help us to understand as only you can, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the first things I want us to do is to talk, look at the place that uh, this church is. I want us to look at the people, and I want us to look at the message. This is an introduction to this letter to the, of the, uh, of, to the Philippian church, uh, to the Philippian family there. And I think it's necessary that we understand a little bit about them and about where they are. And as we, before we get into the message that Paul shares with us to them. And so I'll go ahead and, ha- go ahead and ask you to turn to Acts chapter 16. Uh, we're going to be going back to this. This is the beginning of the church of Philippi. And we talked about it uh, several months back as uh, we were working through the book of Acts on Sunday evening. Uh, but uh, I think it's important and necessary for us to go back to that and to see uh, this a little bit more, especially for those who were not in those discussions. But the place, the place is extremely important. It was a town in Macedonia. Paul's movement uh, into Eastern Europe on his second missionary journey. He's stepping out of Asia. He's stepping out of uh, the place that he had been and preached before. And now he's stepping into a new location, a new area that is being reached with the gospel into Europe itself. And it's Paul, it's Timothy, it's Silas, it's Luke. This is the missionary team that is going out. And they have been, they're planning to continue to preach throughout Asia. But the Holy Spirit stopped them. And we see this in chapter 16, uh, that the Holy Spirit stops them and says, No, I, I don't want you to go any further into Asia to preach the gospel. That seems a little strange. But instead, the Holy Spirit gives Paul a vision of a man pleading for Paul to come to Macedonia, to preach the gospel there. You know, sometimes God stops us from doing something, even when it's something good, because he has a greater plan for us to accomplish. He's got something better that he wants us to do. Uh, You know, going and preaching in Asia and, and continuing his missionary journey there was not a bad thing at all. But it wasn't God's perfect plan. It wasn't what God wanted to accomplish. And so he sent the, through the Holy Spirit this moving, this vision of a man in Macedonia calling Paul to come and preach the gospel. So Paul and his team trying to be observant, trying to be discerning, trying to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit said, okay, we're not going to continue here. We're going to Macedonia. And so they found a, a route to Macedonia And thankfully, they were open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And they make their way to Philippi. And Philippi, just a little bit about Philippi, it was conquered by Philip, 
who was the father of Alexander the Great, thus the name Philippi, uh, being named after him. It was a, a place for gold mines and silver mines. All that kind of wealth was there. But it was also a very fertile land, pasture lands, uh, grasslands, these kinds of things. So it was, uh, had a lot going for it. It was a unique place. It was also historically infamous because it was where the killers of Julius Caesar were finally killed in 42 BC by Mark Anthony and Octavian. And Octavian goes on later to uh, be uh, the ruler. And in 31 BC, just a few years after uh, they defeated uh, uh, the armies of Brutus, uh, they, Octavian grants Philippi this colony status. And it becomes a mini version of Rome. Having a colony status was a very important thing. It was a big deal. It was a point of pride for those who lived there because Roman law, Roman customs, Roman culture were now the norm. The food, the architecture, the social activities, the teaching, all reflected Rome. It was just like you were there in Rome. That was the idea uh, when, uh, in order to be uh, a colony, you were to represent Rome in every aspect. It would have been full of Roman citizens, which are, uh, was a unique place to be outside of the land of Rome. Again, it was a point of pride uh, to uh, have this designation. It was significant. Uh, Luke actually mentions this fact. Uh, that's how important it was to be known as a colony uh, of Rome, to be a mini Rome. But it was not a place full of Jewish uh, people. How do, why do we know that? Well, uh, Paul goes in to find uh, a group of believers, a group that are worshiping God in order to uh, teach them about Jesus Christ. And he has to go down to the river because there is no synagogue that has been built. There had to be at least 10 Jewish males who were heads of households, okay? 10 different families represented uh, for a, a synagogue to be built. And there weren't even 10 families represented in the city of Philippi. So they had to meet down by the river, and you could, I, I could go into the idea behind being, meeting at a river uh, because it's living water, it's moving water. Uh, there's a, it's a wonderful picture uh, that uh, is taught in Scripture about living water, uh, and that's the reason that they would be meeting by the river, a place where they would pray, but also uh, be able to do some of their ceremonies. Um, so this, is, this was a unique place that Paul finds himself and his team find themselves. But now we need to also look at the people that were a part of this church. Um, although this was several years down the road when Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, I'm still sure many of those who were there at the beginning we're still involved in that church, still uh, working and serving and proclaiming the truth of God's word there, still worshiping and praying together there. And so in chapter 16, we find the beginning of the church, uh, of 16, Acts 16, beginning in verse uh, 11. Actually, let's skip down to verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Again, this is a group of women coming together. Uh, again, men uh, were the ones that uh, would uh, uh, have built the synagogue, and it seems to be lacking in that respect. And one who heard us was a woman named Lydia, verse 14, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what, to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, 
If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. The first convert that we see in the church of Philippi is Lydia. She's a seeker. Uh, She is one who is a worshiper of God, but she has not heard about Jesus Christ, God's son. She's not Jewish. She's Gentile. But she is a seeker. And we see that the seeker is saved. She is cultured. She is wealthy, she is well-to-do, but she is open-hearted. Again, she's a businesswoman, she's a seller of purple, uh, which means she's well-to-do because purple cloth is and purple dyes were used for royalty. They were used for people who were extremely wealthy. It is not something that would be purchased just by anyone. She was from Thyatira, uh, the home of purple dyeing process. Again, this was uh, an expensive material uh, that uh, she would be selling, and even the dye uh, to uh, make this kind of material. But again, she is a worshiper of God, although she is not a Jew. She is a Gentile, like Cornelius was, who Peter went to. But the Lord opened her heart. I love that in verse 14. The Lord opened her heart. It wasn't Paul's persuasion, but it was God's moving in her heart and mind. Paul was faithful to teach. Paul was faithful to proclaim. But that's the wonderful thing about it. It's not up to us and what we can do, how persuasive we can be. We simply have to be faithful to proclaim the truth of God's word. And when we do that, God works and moves. The Holy Spirit uh, changes and challenges people's thinking and changes their hearts and brings them to a saving knowledge of him. It's not, it's not what we have to do. We have to be faithful and then put it into God's hand. He is the one that brings the increase. But it, we also see that her whole household was saved and baptized. Apparently, her uh, following of God, her worshiping of God and seeking God was something that really was evident to her household. And uh, they followed her in this salvation, followed her in believing and trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And now, my question is, are you looking to feel that emptiness in your soul? Are you looking uh, to find what brings true, lasting joy? It can be found only in Jesus Christ. The second convert that we see, the second person that we see is one who is probably a part of this church is, is a slave girl. And if you pick up in verse 16 of chapter 16 in Acts, as we were going to the place of prayer, they were going back again to teach and to proclaim uh, to those who were there. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Now this, this is a, a unique person. This is a slave girl. She is a captive. She is in double bondage. And what I mean by that, she is a slave of men, but she is also the slave of a demon. She is controlled by an uh, evil spirit that is in her. And this evil spirit is being used for gain. And she is the one that is suffering because of this. Uh, the, the, in, in the Greek, it talks about the spirit python. And in mythology, uh, the python guarded the temple of Apollo, and this is one that they worshipped here in this place. And it came to be known uh, as someone uh, demon-possessed through whom the python spoke, and uh, they told the future. So this was someone who was sought after. This was looked upon as a gift. Even though this young girl was tormented by this evil spirit, others looked at it on as a gift, and they would pay a lot of money. They would go to great expense to come and hear what this demon had to say, what this python spirit would say about uh, their future. And here she is, proclaiming, That these men are worshippers, servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. It seems like she's doing a good thing, right? 
that she's proclaiming. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, they're proclaiming the truth of Scripture. They're proclaiming uh, who God that these guys serve, the Most High God. They're proclaiming salvation, rescue. But it's not so. For a people who had a pantheon of high gods, she was just muddying the water by associating Jesus Christ with just any other God. The demon within her, Satan, was trying to make it look like she was in alliance with Paul and Silas and all of them. And as a result, this was just another God that you could believe in, another God to add to your collection, another God to give tribute to, not the God. And Paul got tired of this. And it says he was annoyed. He was not annoyed with her because she had no control over what was going on. But he was annoyed with that evil spirit. And uh, he uh, rebuked it in frustration and anger toward the demon. He rebukes it and casts it out. And Paul was defending the gospel from being discredited, from being discounted by that demon, by uh, the lie being put into their, uh, the people's heads that this was just another God to add to a long, long list that we have to pay tribute to. Paul freed her through the power of Jesus' name. And can you imagine how relieved She must have been to be in her right mind, uh, to not be uh, uh, burdened by that anymore, to be under that control, to be tormented like that any longer, uh, to be under that demon's control. And saddled with this. You know, are you saddled by addiction, by alcohol, by drugs, by pornography, by for food, for power? Are you saddled by these? Are these things that are continually pulling on you? Well, the transforming power of Christ can give you freedom from these things. The third one that we see is the jailer. Is a jailer. He's calloused. But the calloused heart is softened. He's indifferent. But he comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul and Silas, because of their releasing of uh, this young lady from the possession of, uh, of the demon, uh, were taken, beaten, because no longer could these guys make money off of her. Their livelihood has been taken away. And so out of anger, out of frustration, out of uh, a spirit of getting back, they have Paul and Silas beaten and thrown into prison. And this is where they meet this jailer. And in verse 23, And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he, the jailer, put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. You know, many times uh, when we see the head jailers in places like that, where they were retired soldiers. They were ones who were used to fighting that uh, would know what to do in a challenging situation, would know how to handle prisoners. So they would also be looking at these guys because they would be loyal and they would be dependable to the, the government that was there. They were t- typically respectable because they were soldiers. But he would have to be very callous. And you couldn't really be a soldier very long without getting callous. To see all the hurt, all the pain, the brutality, the gore that you saw on a regular basis as you fought hand to hand. It would be hard not to be callous. But the job that he was doing right now as the keeper of the jail, the keeper of the prison was also required him to be very callous. It was his job to make sure the punishment was carried out, no matter what that punishment was, how much pain it caused, or who he had to inflict it upon. He was to follow orders. And he carried out his job to perfection because he placed them in the inner prison. There was no care. There was no compassion. He followed the orders to the letter of the law. Keep these guys. Make sure they don't escape. 
So he puts them in the inner prison. Not only does he put them in the innermost part of the prison where it was even harder to escape from, he put them in stocks. And this was not a comfy position. Again, Roman soldiers were in, in Roman uh, guard were known for their torture techniques and for making people as miserable as they possibly could be and still keep them alive. So he carried out his job to perfection. He did what he always did. He followed orders. But then God intervened as Paul and Silas are praising God and they're singing in the middle of the jail, in the middle of the prison. They're praising God and celebrating even in the midst of their hurt and their soreness and the uncomfortableness of having their legs spread apart and up in the air and having to sit in a very uncomfortable position. They are praising God. And God intervenes with an earthquake and he doors of the prison are open and the jailer is awakened and he comes running and he sees that the doors are open. He knows the prisoners have escaped. And so his, all he can think of is the fact that, oh no, I have failed in my job and it's going to mean death and probably not even just death. They're probably going to torture him for a little while as an example of someone who has failed to do his job. And so he takes his sword out and he's ready to kill himself. And Paul calls out, hey, 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 hold up there, fella. We're still here. We're still here. And through the faithfulness of Paul and Silas, the jailer came to believe in Christ and his whole house. He said, what, do, what must I do to be saved? What do I have to do to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? And Paul was able to lead him and his family to the Lord. You know, each one of these had a unique encounter with Jesus. A unique encounter with Jesus. And none was too far from Christ's saving power. We have Lydia, the one who was seeking. She was ethnically an Asian Economically, she was health, wealthy and high standing. Spiritually, she was a God-fearer. She was moral. She was someone who wanted to do right things. And her ministry approach that Paul used was words, that God used was words, Bible study, public proclamation of the gospel. The slave girl, on the other hand, she was a Greek. She was poor. She was exploited and abused. She was possessed by a demon. And God used deeds, a dramatic exorcism, to bring her to a knowledge of Him. To release her from what was going on in her life. The jailer was a Roman. He was a blue-collar worker, everyday type person. He was indifferent and practical. And God used the example of Paul and Silas, singing and praising God and not running away as an example of what it means to be a child of God. The transforming power of salvation cuts across all barriers, all problems, and all struggles. That's a wonderful thing that we see, <coughs> excuse me, in Acts chapter 16. That's what we see in the letter to the Philippians, the power of the gospel to transform. And that transforming power of salvation turns a motley crew of people into a glorious family to build his kingdom in this place called Philippi. The Holy Spirit does the work. We just have to be faithful to proclaim the message. If Paul had not followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, if he had, not con if he had instead continued to preach in Asia... This would have never happened. God's plan would not have accomplished. He would have missed God's greater work for him. And Paul and his team were finally released. The jailer had cleaned them up, had uh, 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 medicated their wounds. Again, a changed heart. That was a lot of compassion being shown from someone who had no compassion. 
But Paul and his team were forced to leave Philippi, but not before the church was established. Look with me in Acts 16, verse 40. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, those who had come to know a saving knowledge of Christ, we don't know who all that might be, but we know a few that would have been there. They encouraged them and they departed from there. Again, we don't know the makeup of everyone in that church, but Paul has a strong connection because of the challenges he faced while there and the support that they gave while he was there. So we've seen the place, Philippi. We've seen the people that are making up this church, a wide range uh, of people of all uh, ethnic uh, uh, groups, of economic groups, spiritual levels. But God is reaching in through his son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the gospel to change and transform lives. Let's look at the message really quickly. The message uh, that uh, we will be looking at over the next few weeks as we go through Philippians. This, this book was written about 10 years later. 10 years, uh, that's what they suggest. Uh, about 10 years after Paul's visit, after his time in the uh, Philippian jail. <clears throat> and typically when we look at Paul's letters, there's a, a general format that he goes by. The first part is all doctrine. He lays out the doctrine and, and the need for that doctrine. But then the second part is how is the application of that doctrine. Uh, typically we see that in most of his letters. But this letter is, doesn't follow that pattern at all. That's, uh, that, uh, it has a much different feel, a much warmer feel, a much more love and compassion written into this book. In fact, this is the only one where he's not trying to correct something significant in the life of the church. He gives some warnings, yes, but there is not an outright reprimand anywhere in the book of Philippians. This is truly a letter of joy and love. And the doctrine and the application that would typically come at the, the doctrine that would typically come at the front and the application at the at the end, it's all scattered through this letter. It's all written in, mingled throughout uh, this uh, letter. The main theme, as I'm sure you've already kind of gathered, is rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Joy in the Lord. Look at uh, uh, 1.4, making a, a, my prayer with joy, 118, and in that I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. 2.2, two, complete my joy. 2.17, I am glad and rejoice with you. 3.1, rejoice in the Lord. And the one everybody always quotes, 4.4, four, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. He is in prison. At this point in time, he is in Rome in prison. It's been a long journey. He was shipwrecked on that journey. He had spent two years already in prison. And yet he can say, rejoice. And I rejoice. I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm rejoicing with you. He knows they're struggling. He knows they're facing opposition. But he says, rejoice in the Lord. He experienced opposition there. And what did he do? How did he handle that opposition there? He rejoiced. He praised God. He sang songs. He and Silas praised the Lord while they were uh, sitting with their feet in stocks in the middle of the prison. He said, I have experienced change there. I am in chains now, but praise God, he is working. This joy, this is an inward peace, a sufficiency that is not affected by outward circumstances. It's, it's not a happiness that we find in, uh, like in times when times are good. It's not that little flutter of excitement 
that you had this week when you opened up your bank account and you saw uh, the um, um, stimulus check in your bank account. It, it, it's not this kind of happiness because happiness is typically based on happenings. The joy Paul is discussing throughout this letter is much deeper than that. It is the fruit produced in our life by the Holy Spirit when we are yielded, when we are obedient to the will of our Father in heaven. When we are obedient and, and uh, yielded to Him, it doesn't matter the circumstances. The peace of God is in our lives. Uh, the strength of God, the comfort of God is in our life. That joy that contentment of knowing you are not alone, that you are being faithful to God, that uh, he is the one in control, and we can trust him. We can say like Paul says in Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It doesn't make sense. The world looks at us and says, how can you be joyful? How can you not be angry right now? It's because of the peace of God. God's joy in us, that deep inward sufficiency of our Heavenly Father. And as he talks about this joy, it runs all through the book, all through the letter. He also brings up some other topics in relation to that joy and the joy of the Lord. The first is the power and fellowship of the gospel of Christ. Verse 5 of chapter 1, partnership in the gospel. Verse 27, let your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. 4, verse 3, who have labored side by side with me in the gospel. And the, the gospel is mentioned more times in the book of Philippians uh, than any other of his letters as far as com in comparison to the length. And he's helping them to un realize and to remember, you know the power of of the gospel to change lives. Look at who was established in the church before I left. Lydia, the slave girl, uh, the jailer, others. You know the transforming power of the gospel. Christ is the one who brings you together in fellowship. He's the reason that you, of, uh, of various social classes, of various ethnicities, uh, of various ages, of all kinds of uh, differences, that we can come together because of Jesus Christ, because of the gospel message. We can come together in one place and do the work of the Father. That's the only thing that brings us together. But it is a wonderful thing that brings us together. This is a deep fellowship which is a connection, which is care, which is concern, which is conversation and deep conversation, not the conversation, not the meal that we have together on Sunday morning after church uh, where we talk about the football game or family or grandkids or this or that. No, it goes much deeper than that where we talk about our experience with our Heavenly Father and we have that unity together. It also talks about right thinking. Humility, preferring others, partnering in the proclamation of the gospel. And you can look in verse 9 of chapter 1, knowledge and discernment, verse 27, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. 2, 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. 3, 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. 4, 8, think about these things. So he brings up the power and the fellowship of the gospel of Christ. He brings up right thinking. He brings up unity and oneness of spirit. Again, 127, with one mind striving side by side to do the work. 2-2, two, two, being of the same mind, being in full accord and of one mind. The power of the fellowship of the gospel, right thinking, unity, or that oneness of spirit. Paul wants the Philippian church to know that this life of joy is possible. 
And he's living it. He's giving that example. And I don't know about you, but right now, I need this. I need this desperately. This longer this uh, going in, uh, in at home and staying at home, sheltering in place goes on, the more I struggle. I need this abiding joy. I need this peace that surpasses all understanding. And we can triumph over our circumstances. How can we triumph over them? How can harmony and peace be brought into our relationships with our children, with our parents? How can peace be brought into my marriage? How can accord be brought into our city, into our state, into our country? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes this as he, in his introduction to the book, of Philippians. And he's writing, I want you to, as I read this, I want you to keep in mind, he's writing in 1947, 1948, just after World War II, and he's uh, uh, um, preaching at Westminster Chapel in London. And this is what he says, now the Christian church announces, amongst other things, that there is only one way in which such a harmonious society can be brought about. Its claim is that nothing but the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ in individual lives can ever produce that state, either individually or in corporate life of men and women. It seems to me that as we consider the whole situation of our world today, nothing is of greater value to us than that we should look at the life of this Christian community in Philippi and see the difficult difficulties resolved and the disagreements banished. To put it in a still another form, we can say that the themes of this epistle are these, how to triumph over circumstances and how to live happily and harmoniously together. Paul is telling us through the transforming of the gospel that this can happen. We can live harmonious. Life can be restored. And look how his life was changed. He went from being a persecutor a killer of those who follow the way to one who is now preaching and proclaiming the truth of the way. Look at the church again. This is a wealthy woman, a possessed girl, a callous jailer, jailer. All of these coming together and forming the family of God there in Philippi. How encouraging this is. Their lives were transformed by the mighty power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Was life easy after that? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. Paul is writing to them to encourage them to stay strong, to stay firm. And he is living the example for them as well. Because he says, I rejoice, rejoice with me. Even though I am in chains, I still rejoice in the Lord. And I encourage you to rejoice in the Lord. Paul is also telling them and telling us today, That we have been saved to serve. Saved to serve. So think rightly. So work in unity. And that gospel still transforms today. That's a wonderful thing. That gospel still transforms today. It changes lives today. And all you have to do is accept this rescue Accept this salvation. You know, man is messed up. We've rebelled against God. We've sinned against God. And that sin deserves death. But God has made a way of rescue. We're headed down the road to death, but there is rescue available. And all we have to do is admit our sin. Confess Jesus as Lord or leader of our life. And believe that God has raised him from the dead and that Christ is alive. We celebrated that last week. And every Sunday we celebrate that. And you know what the Bible tells us will happen once we admit our sin. Confess Jesus as Lord or leader of our life. Believe that God has raised him from the dead. You will be rescued. You will be saved. Now, if you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord of your life this morning, 
I want you to call the phone number listed below and leave a message if uh, it's not answered. Because we want to give you materials. We want to put materials in your hands to help you grow in faith in Christ. Remember, you have been saved to serve. It's not just enough to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, he calls you to live in victory in him. That doesn't mean life is going to be easy. Life may still just be just as difficult. But you will have the Holy Spirit walking beside you through all of this. And changing your heart, your mind, your spirit. To do the work God has called you to do. So, call that number that's on the bottom of your screen this morning. Leave us a message. Leave us your phone number. We want to get information to you. How you can grow in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in your walk with him. And see what God can, how God can transform your life. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that... Your salvation still transforms lives today. We've seen lives transformed. People who would have nothing to do with you now are adamant servers of you. Those who struggle with addictions of various kinds now have freedom in you. Those who are seeking you find that joy and peace that only you can give. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Ask your blessings on those who are here today. May you work powerfully in their lives. If they don't know you as Lord and Savior, may they come to know you today. If they have not accepted that rescue, may they do so today. And those who are believers, Lord, those who are struggling right now in this time, may their hearts be encouraged. May they experience your joy, your peace, your strength, your comfort. May they trust in you, knowing you are in control. We praise your name, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to share this with someone today. Uh, we may not can invite someone to church, but we can invite someone to watch and hear the message of salvation. I'd love to see 10 different shares uh, on our feed today. I encourage you to do that and get the message of the gospel to those who are hurting. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.